Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of the NACTA and Affiliates virtual programming lineup. I'm Dana Leroy, Communications Manager for NACTA, and we're glad to have you here with us for this sponsored content session with DME Delivers, titled Game Changer, A Look into the Future of Fundraising. DME Delivers is a vertically integrated marketing solutions company that is dedicated to the collegiate market with a high concentration in athletics development. Leveraging their in-house creative agency and production facility, DME de develops customized campaigns to engage donors. From membership and fundraising appeals, ticket renewals, donor stewardship, and game day promotions, DME delivers it all. DME combines personalized creative and quality communications with athletics-focused products and proprietary gifting technology to create unique marketing engagements designed to excite and motivate your donors, alumni, and fans. Today's discussion is going to be led by Ty Edwards, Senior Business Development Manager at DME. Ty is going to introduce our campus panelists in just a moment, but before I hand things over to him, I want to remind our live attendees who are using Zoom to utilize that Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and send in your questions for our speakers throughout the presentation, as we will have dedicated time at the end to answer them. And with that, the floor is yours, Ty. Uh, thank you, Dana. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ty Edwards with DME Delivers. I am lucky enough to be joined by four of the brightest minds in athletic development today. Um, I'd like to introduce them. So we'll start with you, Paul Vasilla. Good morning, everyone. Um, Paul Vasilla, Gator Booster at the University of Florida, Director of External Affairs. Great. Charlie Thrash. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Charlie Thrash. I'm our Associate Athletic Director for Development um, here at the University of Texas at El Paso. Maddie Baller Burkhart. Hi, everyone. I'm Maddie, a Senior Director of Development Operations at the University of Nebraska. And, of course, Brett Berg. Good morning. I'm Brett Berg. I'm Assistant VP for um, Athletics Development here at the University of West Florida in Pensacola. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, can't wait to get into the conversation. Should be a lot of fun, so we're going to we're going to kick it on off. Um, Paul, I'm going to start with you. On a scale of one to 10, what is your confidence level for return to normal with fall sports? And how have you communicated your approach to your constituents and donors? I'm feeling pretty confident, maybe like eight or nine, that uh, many of the restrictions that we've all had to deal with will be lifted by football season. Uh, I think the interesting question is what's the backlash? The, what, you know, what's the aftermath, the psychological hurdles that our fan base will have to overcome? Maybe on one end, it's actually, a, you know, even the introverts are craving interaction again, and it just explodes, and everybody wants to be around people again. But the likelihood is that people will have a difficult time being shoulder to shoulder, sweating in 100 degree heat, you know, next to one another. So how do we grow towards that? But the restrictions themselves, I think, will be lifted. You know, what is that new normal? I'm sure we're going to have plexiglass near any food area for, you know, the foreseeable future. Uh, that's where I see it's going. Uh, from a communication standpoint, we were actually very fortunate. Our deadline to renew last year was the day of the shutdown. So we had money in the bank and we were able to kind of continue business as usual, even though we knew it was an interesting time. But we went forward with seat selections single game tickets, away game sales, Florida, Georgia. We just kind of kept communicating. When something is official to be announced, we will do so. But in the interim, we will operate as usual. And then of course, finally that information came in August when things had to alter and we changed our game plan. But for right now, we're kind of resuming business as usual. We have renewals that went out two weeks ago. Uh, deadline is in early March. We had a Hefty amount of people roll over. So we already have money in the bank for 2021 and just trying to recapture those that requested that refund and get the sense of whether or not they have any desire to enter this type of you know, sports environment again. Uh, like most programs, I'm sure we all have an aging booster population. And so the comfort of the TV, we've all been fighting that as well. The in-home experience, how many people you know, won't come back? You have to be determined. How did the rollover affect your budgets and outlook on this past year and moving forward, knowing that just because you have those funds doesn't necessarily mean that you can utilize those the way that you want to? 
I think we did just about everything we could in favor of the donor. When we sent out communications in August, uh, we gave the option to donate, refund, purchase single game tickets. We didn't sell them on a single package. We just thought maybe somebody needed to whet their appetite, go to one game if they could kind of muster up that courage to do so, and then potentially roll over to next year. So the way I think our, the way our budget fell was that we took this big hit in 2020. You know, at the time I was thinking, oh, well, we already have money in. Are we going to spend that 2021 money now just to kind of bridge that gap? But any money that went, that was rolled over 2021 is in the 2021 fiscal year budget. So we had to pull from some reserves uh, and then take in some of the revenue that by being able to have fans in the stadium, uh, I think we made it through okay. Maddie, Nebraska was a little adamant last year about they want to play football. We got to play football. Big Ten needs to play football. What what is it? Where do you stand now? I mean, our our fans loved that. It was it was really beneficial to us on the fundraising side. We did the same thing as Paul. We were very, very fan centric with allowing them to roll it over, donate it, um, or get a refund. But we saw a really great response of people donating it because they felt like we were fighting for our players so much in our administration and our coaches were fighting for our players. Um, so I, we were able to really capitalize on that with just the timing of everything. And um, it was it was a tough season, but you know we were one of the only teams who didn't have a, a, a long break with any COVID cases with our team. So I think our fans are really proud of our players for the discipline they had all season. And, you know, same as Paul, we're, we're now in a pretty good spot with renewals because we had so many people roll over or donate it back, and we saw some really strong support there. But we weren't able to have any fans, so we didn't have any of that small revenue you did have, Paul, so a little jealous there. Well, we're in Florida where everything is wide open now. So, uh, Charlie, I know that you mentioned that you're getting ready to start renewing your um, ticket holders. What's the process like that look like for you, knowing that, you're a little bit behind some of these other programs. Yeah, so we're, um, we sent out a press release uh, about our upcoming um, renewals schedule uh, the day after the national championship, kind of that cliche line, you know, next season starts today type of deal, um, kind of laying it out of, of how we're going to conduct uh, football renewals for this upcoming year. And, you know, we've just been trying to display as much optimism as we can. Um, so we resorted to, uh, um, allowing, you know, 2019 seat locations uh, to be renewed again instead of our 2020 uh, socially distanced seats. Um, so we are uh, going to let donors renew those seats. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if, our, if our situation does, you know, once we, we get to uh, August or fall, fall and we have to resort back, you know, we have that plan in place based off of what we did in 2020 obviously hoping that uh, we don't have to resort to that. So we're, we're just displaying as much optimism as we can. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the, the 100 million vaccinations in 100 days, it goes well. And, you know, by the, by the fall, we can, people are comfortable and are, are excited. And I don't know about everybody else here, but the day that we uh, have normal football games again, people are just, it's going to be, it's such a huge celebration in our, in our country. People are going to be so excited to have normal football games, normal fanhood. Um, you know, you look at some of the old old games from 2019 and 2018, you're like, wow, that's that's completely different than it, than it obviously was this last year. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's what we can get back to. Absolutely. And Charlie, we're going to stick with you. So you started at UTEP about six months before the pandemic really took over. Mm -hmm. How, if any, did COVID affect your ability to engage with those donors in a meaningful way? Yeah, you know, um, I, so yeah, I got to UTEP in September 2019, and uh, you know, so I had about five, six months to to really hit the ground running and um, you know meet people at our football and basketball games in a normal setting. And then, you know, obviously once the pandemic hit in March, uh, changed everything just like it it did for for everybody else. So obviously tried to leverage all, a lot of those relationships that uh, I was able to develop over those six months. Um, uh, but also as we moved into March, you know, and not being able to do face to face, um, our staff, uh, which did a wonderful job um, of really diving headfirst into the ticketing aspect, um, because that was a way to have touch points. It was a way to 
uh, have conversations in an adverse setting where, you know, yeah, you might not be getting the same seats that you've normally, you know, you might've had for the last 40 years, but, you know, we're definitely going to take care of you in the future. And, um, you know, trying to have as much communication uh, from a ticketing process as possible to be able to leverage that into the future um, for fundraising purposes. So, you know, just having a lot of those ticketing conversations with individuals that maybe wouldn't necessarily be in our, our smaller portfolio, you know, that Joe Smith down the street who just has his, uh, uh, his PO box and, uh, you know, you're not able to get uh, much information on, you know, maybe where he lives or what his business, all of a sudden you're having a, a conversation and he's a business owner of, you know, uh, 50 plus employees. And you're like, oh, okay, this is a really good prospect. And I'm glad that, you know, I was able to have this conversation renewing his season tickets uh, so that we can leverage our relationship, you know, in the future, stay in touch and obviously uh, do a good job with them. So, um, you know, I think that that was just the biggest thing was being, you know, the, the buzzwords of flexible, nimble uh, during that time period so that once we get out and we are able to have normal meetings, which we, we have been able to to a certain degree over the last, you know, few months. Uh, but, you know, really trying to gear up so once there is a normalcy, we can um, take advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. And Brett, since you're in Pensacola, it's kind of a tight community there. Um, how has that affected you? Are you doing a lot of Zoom calls? Are you sick of those yet? Or Yeah, we, we you know, for us, we were lucky in the fact that we had more fan interaction probably than we've had in a long time, just because, you know, basically that fall of before everything shut down, we had just won a football national NCAA, the D2 national championship. And had five straight playoff games where we had booster and alumni events at every one of those games. And um, then the national championship game with everybody there. So we had a great opportunity to, to engage with donors, build those relationships for all of our staff across the university. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, we had some championship plans scheduled and we had a big Mardi Gras parade and the team was the led the parade and everything. And we were lo really looking forward to doing some different things with our ring ceremony and championship celebrations. And then, bam, you know, we can't see anybody. We can't go meet anybody. So for us, it's really been, you know, like everybody else trying to figure out ways to engage with them and try and connect them. So we've done some different Facebook Live and Zoom events and then really just reaching out, um, doing thank you videos, personalized thank you videos, having student athletes do thank you videos and sending them directly to, this, to those donors, thanking them for their support. Um, and then a lot of handwritten notes and phone calls and trying to um, talk to people. The good thing is, is we've had probably longer conversations and more in-depth conversations um, by just having that phone call than, um, you know, having a five-minute interaction at a game, we were able to have a 30-minute phone call. Um, so there's been some positive results from that. And really, um, you know, people really enjoy talking. Um, I think people were not, you know, having touch points with people. So having that human interaction People liked getting on the phone and having that good conversation. So it, again, allowed us to really kind of cement those relationships. So it's been good for us. So there is a positive that came out of last year. There's, there's a couple. Um, there's some of them are smaller than others, but there's, there's been a couple, yes. Of course. Um, so Maddie, I want to kind of switch it up a little bit. Does the Huskers Athletic Fund have a benefit plan specific for philanthropic versus any sort of transactional giving your ticket sales and anything like that? Uh, like many of you, we're, we're still counting those required seat donations towards our membership levels, even though they're not tax deductible anymore. But um, so our, our benefits plan is all encompassing no matter where those dollars for donations are going. But, you know, we have been a really transactional place for a long time. We have three sold out venues that have required seat donations. And that includes a 8,000 seat volleyball venue where there are donations tied to every seat. And that's, that's really unusual. So a lot of our donors, you know, you might be given 25,000 a year and that's just for your seats for volleyball, basketball and football combined. So it's kind of been a, a long-term path for us to convert a lot of those donors into philanthropic minded giving. But um, Charlie and I were talking about this before the call that it, it's been a really good opportunity this year with us having people roll over their tickets or donate it back. We've, people have kind of exposed themselves that they, they maybe are more philanthropic minded. So we have some really good 
data now to go off of to look at all these folks who decided to donate their money back even though they didn't get to go to a single game this fall um, in, in the middle of a pandemic. So, I mean, one stat is our, our volleyball fans. You know, we have these 2000 season ticket holders and 97% of them either donated it or rolled it over. So I, that's just amazing. So we we really need to go back now and that's kind of on us to dig through that data to, to look at these folks and people who have given their first time gifts and, and go after them. So are you going to use that data to compare volleyball versus basketball versus football? And where do you go with that data? That's a great question. So many of our season ticket holders are, are local. I mean, I think it's like 83% of our donors are right here in Lincoln or Omaha. So, you know, most of them have tickets in all of those areas. So um, it's hard for us to really separate that out because most people are supporting all of our sports, at least our major sports that have season tickets. So, but there is, I think, some opportunities, you know, volleyball right now has such a following. We're a top five team. We're going to be competing for a national championship and it'll be right here in our backyard in Omaha. So, you know, there is some, that's probably our hottest, our hottest ticket right now, our, our hottest thing to follow. So there are some opportunities, I think, to segment out some of those donors of people who are more focused on volleyball, but um, you know, we've got some really good data to sift through here and to look at look at these people who have exposed themselves. And Paul, you mentioned earlier um, about the rollover figures from last year to this year. How are you able to utilize that moving forward? Are you going to identify those donors as a specific type of donor, something new, or where do you go with that? Uh, no, I wouldn't say anything new. I mean, they're just, I think they're just people who just decided to take the year off. Um, you know, for our fan base, and most people are within that two hour radius, but we did notice you know, those outside the two hour radius um, were really quick to roll over. They just felt it was um, not ideal to travel that far to come to a game, especially if they weren't coming with anybody of their friends. We had no tailgating on campus, even though we had fans in the stands. So whether people opted out of fear of just the virus or just the lack of the uh, environment. Um, we just, you know, we're treating those that rolled over as a, hey, everything's gonna come back to normal. They're back on board. Very good. So Brett, you have your hands in a lot at UWF. You oversee all the fundraising efforts, a lot of the marketing. How have you found value utilizing a marketing partner to help you kind of lift some of that weight? Sure. I mean, for us, the biggest thing is um, it frees us up from our time and gives us more time to fundraise. So um, when I first came here, um, you know, when we were doing benefit fulfillment for boosters, it was literally um, ordering small, medium T-shirts, pulling a medium T-shirt out, packing it into a box, sending it to them, trying to make sure that we send in the right size to the right donor and sitting there taking tape and trying not to wrap your hand in the tape and wrap, making the box closed. And it was a lot, a lot of crazy stuff and a lot of time. So for us, the biggest thing was um, looking at a way to try and maximize our time. So where we can um, not only make it easier for us, but also make it better for our donors. So what we really tried to do is look at, okay, what can we do that makes things better for our donors? So for example, you know, when don't, when I first started, the donors had about five things that they could pick from. And regardless of what level you gave at, you had the same five things you could choose from. So we tried to do it where, um, you know, having a situation where people can go on and at our different levels, now they have six to eight to 10 choices per level, and they can go in and pick those, whatever they want in those levels. Um, so it'll, it gives our donors much more flexibility. They can go online and pick what they want. So they don't have to, um, you know, contact us. They can just go on the website at midnight, pick what they want to want to get and have it shipped directly to them. Um, so it saved us a lot of time and effort, not only on the, the membership packets, but also on the donor fulfillment on the benefit side. And what we found over time, it's been pretty cool too, is um, a lot of our donors, you know, that what we used to do is we just get showed them what was available at their level. Now we show them what's available at every, their level and every level below them. Um, so we've had a lot of donors that also, you know, instead of the hundred dollar nice jump, you know, jumpsuit type thing, they go and pick the $10 hat or something. Um, and that saves us money as well. So it's a way for us to do some cost savings. And the, ultimately the donor got what they wanted. They got to pick exactly what they wanted. So it's been, it's been good for us and it gives them a lot more um, selection, a lot more ideas. And um, it keeps 
me and my staff from boxing things up, which is, has been a huge thing. Um, some of our newer staff has never had to do that. So they're pretty lucky, but um, we, we've done, spent a lot of time doing that. And now we just send a list over uh, to DME and DME takes care of it for us. Have you uh, noticed any sort of increase in your branding being out within the city and, and around the area with the Argonauta Athletic Club and the apparel, the hats, gear, whatever the case may be? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for us, we really tried to look at from a um, from a fundraising perspective and obviously a cost perspective is we wanted our brand out there. Um, so we looked at, OK, well, do we decrease our gift card cost to us in order to use some more of that money for a fund, you know, to put towards other initiatives here at the university or other teams? And we felt like for the last couple of years, we're starting to trend in that direction, but we, we really wanted the brand out there. So we really wanted people to, to get their gear. We wanted them to pick something and pick a shirt or a sweatshirt or a jacket or a hat and get that gear and wear it. Because um, when, you know, Oregon Athletic Club didn't have a, a brand per se. Um, so we wanted them to get that gear, wear it around town. And it's made a big difference for us because, you know, people will see people wearing it and they'll start asking questions and they'll say, hey, you know, how, how do you get that? Well, you have to join the booster club to get it. That's the only way you can get this gear. So it's been good for us where it, it generates discussion and it generates, we've had people like, Ooh, I want to get that sweatshirt. So I'm going to increase my giving so I can go up to the next level. Um, and so I can have access to that sweatshirt. So that, from that perspective, it's increased giving and it's increased the number of donors. So it's been good for us. I, I just wanted to, to add something as well. Um, you know, you and I have worked together for, for many years now. And, um, you know, I just, in, from a marketing perspective, you know, I, I've always enjoyed the professionalism um, that, you know, the pieces that, that we, and the gifts that we've provided, you know, through, through DM, it, you have been, you know, highly professional in it. Uh, you know, just talking about the brand as, as Brett was mentioning, um, it does well for your brand when people get something in the mail that's customized, unique, and, um, I, you know, this was a perfect year to send stuff in the mail because I think in March and April, everybody was checking their mail every day at, uh, while they're stuck at home as, as a way to pass time. So getting something cool in the mail, you know, it, it, it definitely validates your, your brand, you know, that the, uh, you know, Gator Boosters or the Minor Athletic Club is, is, is important and it's here to stay. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you have to build that brand, create awareness and, really start a conversation. Um, so Paul, you've been with the Gators for a decade and a half. Can you tell me a little bit about the history behind the benefits and how you went from supplying everyone with a regular tangible item, just give it to them, um, to where you are now with letting them select their own item and, and the benefits that come along with that? Yeah, some similar comparisons to what uh, Brett described. I mean, when I got here in 2006, uh, we already had a history of purchasing items for each donor level uh, in bulk, and it was it was challenging when you had to you know, a make that selection that just across the board, regardless of people's demographics, whether it's a luggage tag or a duffel bag or something like that. You know, for the most part, we were ordering from China. If it was around this time of year, where they're you know you're approaching Chinese New Year, and then it's everybody's off for three weeks or whatever it was, and then finally. If there were issues with those packages coming in through customs and the ports in the West Coast and you wanted to get it out before the football season started, you really had to be kind of forward thinking. And I want to say maybe it was 09 or 2010 when um, we're fortunate, DME is based out of Daytona and uh, one of the representatives just knocked on the door and we were talking and the concept of mall system was pitched. It was a no brainer for us uh, and has proved as such to what you know Red described. We basically send everybody a code with uh, a few options. And you know, no matter what, you know, what we were doing before, 100% of the people got a gift. So we, that money is gone. They may have thrown it away. They may have given it away. They didn't like it, whatever it was. At least now they have a little bit of a power to choose. We've never, I don't think we've ever hit over 70% redemption. So we've already saved money by the people who just either forget to do it or just say, hey, no, I, I don't need this tchotchke. Why don't you? Um, keep my money. And then likewise, you know, we may have selected a $30 price point item for them, but they go in the marketplace and they choose the $12 Tervis Tumblr. So there's uh, multiple ways for um, the cost saving that we've experienced. 
Uh, I've toured the DMV, DME facility. They do a heck of a job. It's a really nice setup. Uh, their graphic design, their creativity is really good. And then, you know, how it might even change for us moving forward, you know, this past summer, as we were exploring all the ways to be flexible and nimble with our, uh, with our donors and what was gonna happen with the season, we pitched an idea to DME and uh, DME was, as always, quick to say, yes, we'll figure it out. Let's get to work on it. And so we gave our donors a marketplace. We created this website together with DME where we updated their donation and ticket balance all in one amount. And through that portal is where our donors elected to donate, refund, roll over, or use that balance to purchase something in the marketplace. And we tried to gather anything that we already had in hand or experiences that we could provide. So it could have been you know, $200 for a pair of uh, Jordan brand shoes. It could have been $10,000 to play golf with Coach Spurrier. And you know, just any way to incentivize those season ticket holders who were opting out to just keep something in the system. They could do all the above. They could, they could buy the shoes, donate $1,000, refund a third of their money, whatever it was, all that was in the portal. And so thinking through for the future is, okay, you know, instead of buying the Turvis Tumblr gift, uh, maybe we start providing them with credits and maybe credits that roll over, booster box, whatever we want to call it. And uh, that might lead to an experience rather than just each year taking the t-shirt or you know, whatever else we come up with, the double bag concept. So with the experiences, do you think post 2020, you'll have as much buy-in from your coaches, other staff members to facilitate some of those, the fishing charter with Mike White or going golfing with Steve Spurrier? Do you think you'll have the buy-in after the pandemic has kind of got us all back to normal? Well, certainly everybody was on board this year. I think everybody understood and was you know, quick to sign up for it. Um, and certainly you're gonna have your big ticket coaches, right? Your, your football, former football coach and men's basketball coach. But we, we have an awesome group of head coaches and assistant coaches throughout our 21 sports. So uh, utilizing them and their personalities and you know, their, whether even it's just a Zoom call or a birthday message, I mean, part of the genesis of this concept was almost like the, if you're familiar with the website, cameo.com and where you can have a celebrity send somebody you love a, a birthday message or whether it's the actor that plays Kevin from The Office, I think I made like over a million dollars last year doing that. And that's what we're kind of getting at. And not having our coaches leave campus is, is huge. Um, so yeah, you can get a, a golf lesson with our men's or women's head golf coach, but even just a, a message via Zoom for a big fan. So can we, again, instead of spending that money, we give them a virtual credit that they can then spend in the marketplace and um, utilize all that we have to provide here. It doesn't cost us anything. So if they were to, if they were able to kind of save those funds and roll them over to next year, that's more incentive for them to keep renewing, makes your job a little bit easier as well. That's what it sounds like. Correct. Mm -hmm. Ty, I just wanted to jump in too, if um, offer up, if anybody's in a smaller shop out there and you don't have a big budget, um, we've done some really high impact pieces with DME that have been really low cost. We did a really cool tailgate flag that was just over $3 per unit to do. And this year I saw, we sent that flag out two years ago. And this year I saw one of our cutouts that a fan bought. He was stationed overseas in Kuwait and the photo was of him holding the flag stationed overseas. So $3 piece was important enough for him to bring that with him. Um, when he was shipped out. So there are some really good options out there that you can do if you do have a smaller budget. And uh, my other favorite thing that they do is they'll do the graphic design for you. So if you don't have a large shop that can do that in-house graphic design or they don't have the resources to pull away from recruiting, they will do it for you. And that's probably my, my favorite thing that saves us a ton, ton of time that they can do our brand, capture what our look is, and then do that all in-house. And hey, Maddie, now that you say that, the field shot we did where we, we actually used the uh, Memorial Stadium with the band spelling out the donor name on the field, did you see any sort of rise in engagement either via social media or phone calls that kind of help you think that that's, wow, this is really something that works? 
Yeah, so it, what we did was a really simple piece um, this year because we were pinching our budget. Um, so we kind of cut back of what we would normally send out. And yep, we spelled everybody's last names. DME did for us on the field, like the band was spelling their name. And it was a good marketing piece because it was marketing our capital campaign on that piece as well. And what I heard from donors is it was something that they were going to keep. So that makes me happy. If it's going on the fridge with our contact info and advertising our capital campaign, and it was a dollar fifteen piece that they're going to hold on to. That's huge. We had I had a lot of people asking if they could get larger prints of it. They wanted to give that as a Christmas gift to their son that had their name on the field. So there, I'm just want to explain to folks there's there's some really good stuff you can do if you have a small budget. And those were all things Ty brought to me. He said, "Hey, look, look, this is something that another school did. I think." you know, this would be good for you. And I went to him and I said, hey, we're in a pandemic. We've got to cut our budget. I'm looking at this amount of money is what I have to work with. What can we do to find a high impact, low cost piece that, that's going to get to our donors and get them something in the mail? Yeah, it turned out really nice too. Um, so Charlie, you've worked in development offices all over the country, um, Tampa, Wyoming, now at, in El Paso. In your experience, what are some of your best practices when marketing and communicating to never and lapsed donors that you may not have met before? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I, I, you know, just from my experience, I think, you know, doing some type of mini campaign that is, that is fun and is and engaging uh, from a social media standpoint um, is definitely important. And I think it's kind of the, the key to, to having a, a good mini campaign. I mean, usually mini campaigns don't, you know, don't affect the, the bottom line too much uh, from a fundraising aspect, but, you know, what you do get in the door from a donor number standpoint can definitely have an impact on, you know, if you have a goal to get to 2,000 donors. I mean, these type of things have a, have a or 3,000, have a huge impact. And, you know, Maddie brought up the, the flags and I've, uh, I've seen, you know, plant your flag campaigns do, do really well, um, you know, where, if an individual plants their flag, you know, then you have a kind of a, a micro site that has a, a live map where, you know, somebody in Alaska who is a, a UTEP fan planted their flag and going into the season, you know, I think when I was at USF, we did like for $147, you know, you could plant your flag, which at the time our football program had 147 victories and we were trying to get to 150, but, you know, being able to play on kind of that, um, got people uniquely involved. And um, here at UTEP, we just recently did a, a Defend the Dawn uh, mini campaign. Uh, Don Haskins Center is our basketball arena. And um, uh, we, uh, we, we promoted that going into basketball season because we weren't necessarily having fans. Um, but this was a unique way to, to help us defend, you know, defend, our, defend our turf, even though you can't be there. And we had a bunch of different giving levels and tchotchkes and a raffle and, you know, kind of all those things that you normally see. Uh, but getting that on social media and getting people to, um, to, to latch on, because then once they get in the door, then it's on our, it's our job as development officers to then, you know, reach out and educate them on our mission even more that, yeah, yes, this gift might've been transactional, uh, but it's having a huge impact, not only on, you know, student athlete lives, but, it's having an impact on our community as, as well. So being able to educate those individuals and then renew them. And then, you know, you get them on the donor continuum on the way up and try to get them to increase their giving um, by getting in the door. Um, I think doing something fun and, uh, and uh, engaging from that aspect can, can have tangible effects. And Paul, since you've been there so long, what, how would, have you seen it evolve over the years with your never lapsed donors? Does it really be affected by the sports or is it just the changes that happen during the life? It's just the changes that happen in their life. So when Tebow, when Tebow left, it still stayed, stayed pretty, pretty current? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we've certainly had our decline um, over the years. And in fact, I was just using this analogy the, the other day. We, we were fortunate that uh, we won a national championship in the 2008 season after the economy collapsed and where many programs were starting to feel that pinch. You know, we probably uh, stiff armed it for a year or two. And, uh, you know, we hired Coach Muschamp, who was a you know, big name at the time. He was the head coach in waiting at, at Texas, but kind of the you know, 
you know, when Urban left, just that uncertainty, he was, he was here and then he came back and it just kind of burst our bubble a little bit to where some people who had been pushing through that economic pain just found the reason to no longer, you know, renew. And then all the battles I, I alluded to it earlier, all the battles that we we're all facing with TV and the at-home experience and the commitment to uh, the cost of a weekend, not just the cost of a ticket to the game, but the cost of the weekend. Uh, we're certainly seeing that decline. The culture of the season ticket holder is is leaving us. I think people want to choose three or four games a year. And the uncertainty of game times has all been, you know, huge impacts. Uh, for, for somebody to commit in March for a season ticket, they have teenagers or kids that play sports in the fall. They don't even know their kids' sports times. They don't know our game times until Monday. They may have the money and the willingness to give, but they just can't commit. And that's what we're seeing. So, Maddie, how does your fundraising strategy change when you're hiring a new football coach? Let's say Scott Frost, who's a former alum. What do you do to to kind of help your donor base get excited? Um, he did that for us right when he came on. So, um, I mean, right when he was hired, it was it was full send. Everyone was on board. Our, our season ticket request list went up. We sold out our our spring game in under two hours. And um, we were able to then launch a big capital campaign for a new football facility with that momentum. So it, for us, it's leveraging kind of his star power. He is the biggest star in our state by far. You know, we don't have any celebrities outside of Warren Buffett for him to compete with. So he is, he is the man. Um, but it's also then kind of managing those expectations because he is a native son of Nebraska. Um, people feel like they know them and they feel like they, you know, they want to get to know them and they want to get in front of them. So kind of managing those expectations with donors, but also we, we, he's still our biggest draw. So we don't want to, you know, oversaturate sometimes the amount of requests that we get for footballs to be signed for him for charity auctions is just insane. But our biggest stewardship tool we can still give somebody is an autographed Scott Frost football. So we have to manage that a lot. Um, but like I said, he is our biggest draw. We, we sold cutouts this year, like I'm sure everyone did. And we were able to sell these thousand dollar cutout packages because they were going to be signed by Scott Frost. And we raised $75,000 just off a hundred Scott Frost signatures. So um, he, he does have that power. And when we can use that to our advantage, it is really powerful. Yeah. So I'm a UCF grad. Can we have him back now? <laughs> uh, you got a vacancy to fill. Yes. Um, Paul, Dan Mullen was was there through the good years. And now he's back. How did that impact your team and your uh, the Gator Boosters? Yeah, Coach Coach Mullen has been an incredible asset for us. You know, even thinking back to the day he was hired, there might have been some Gator fans that were like eh, questioning it a little bit, but it was, it was a Sunday morning that he was hired, and then that evening was kind of that Tennessee uh, debacle that we all kind of watched on on social media. And kind of already made our fans feel good about the hire. But then with the, uh, the opening press conference, he, he just nailed it. And he brings a lot of energy, a big smile. Uh, his first few months on the job, he, uh, well, first year on the job, I don't think he said no to really anything that requested. We, we tried not to overextend those requests. But with our big donors, uh, or even if it's just signing footballs, uh, he was he went above and beyond. His wife is incredibly engaging. So when we've had them both at our board meetings, I think even in my time here, I think there's always something our donors like if, when they see the coach kind of like the first family and, um, and having young kids in the program, you know, it's nothing against coach McElwain who's, whose kids were older, but when they see um, a young family, uh, it, it really helps them identify with them, even if they're much older than coach and his wife. And uh, they're, they're incredibly smart. They, uh, they know a lot of pop culture. They can talk about many things other than, uh, other than football, and that's where our, our donors have uh, gravitated to. And I'm speaking more of like in our major gift side as far as they get a little bit more access to him. But he's, even this past spring, had done some Zoom calls with some of our major gift uh, prospects and donors, updating them on the program, what it was like bringing the kids back on campus. And we're just uh, very fortunate to have him here because he's he's been great. And then Brett, you had kind of a little bit different situation. You started football in 2017. 16. How did that, 16. How did that process work for you guys? Um, 
as far as on the development side? Well, obviously, you know, to start football, there was a big lift on the fundraising side to start that program. So for us, we tried to leverage everything we could um, with the start of the program and hiring that first coach. Um, you know, for us, we're, you know, it's the first coach ever in the history of your program. So we tried to leverage that as much as possible and try and um, get him out there. So we, uh, when he first started, we basically got him out on the speaking circuit and got him out to Rotary clubs and Sertoma clubs and all around town. And we held booster events where we had him talk so people could get to know him and see his enthusiasm and see his excitement about the program. I mean, he's our, he could sell it better than anybody. You know, if he could walk into the, the room and sell it to mom and dad and, and that recruit, he can definitely sell it to donors. So we tried to set that, set that up and create fundraising initiatives around that. So we created a football funder founder, um, opportunity where people can make a gift to help start the program. And we did locker initiatives and uniform initiatives and all kinds of different things to help fund the program. So it was, it was a good way to truly try and leverage that. And now it's kind of transitioned like, okay, we got to start the program. And now we've had success. Thankfully um, we've been to the national championship game in our second year and our fourth year of playing football. Um, so we tried, you know, now it's, how do we keep them? So um, we're trying to leverage that as well as letting our donors have an opportunity to help us keep him and, and give him what he needs to continue to be successful. You know, when he started, he likes to say he started with a desk and a phone. Um, so now he actually has an office um, and we have, you know, a new locker room for the football team and things like that. But um, what, what do they need next? You know, what is that thing that that football team needs next that you, you can help us get to um, to help you know, keep our coach and, and keep him here in Pensacola and help us continue to win. Um, so we're, we're, you know, in the middle of a capital campaign and then the pandemic hit. And um, obviously, you know, we had March was when we were kicking off a lot of our small group meetings for our campaign. And it was literally, okay, well, we're not doing that right now. So um, we've had to kind of slow down, but we don't plan on stopping um, and we're continuing to push through it. So um, using our coach and leveraging him as much as possible has been great for us because um, he, he's a great person and a great spokesperson for our program. Yeah, that's great. Have you, um, so Pensacola is really tight. Have you been able to engage your alumni and businesses to help you kind of create more ambassadors for the Argonaut Athletic Club? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for us, you know, um, our goal was to get people excited and get them connected. Um, so we, we really tried to expand our outreach. Like I said, we had our not only Pete, but our athletic director, myself, other coaches go out to different clubs and stuff around town and really try and build on that. Um, not only here in Pensacola and the Panhandle, but you know, we, we haven't had a huge reach historically outside of this area. Um, so we, we did a big push with our alumni association to do different uh, um, meetings around the state um, and then meetings up in Atlanta and out in Texas and Washington, DC and New York and California, really trying to expand our reach. And a lot of those donors in those areas, you know, they hadn't had somebody come from our school in 20 years. So it was a great way for us to connect to those people um, and get, get that touch point and really get them engaged back in the university. Cause you know, they, they hadn't, you know, like I said, the university itself is only 50 years old. It was a two year school for years. Um, it's only been a four year school for about 30 years. So trying to create that sense of, I love my school um, and that school spirit, we've, we've strategically tried to work on that and try and get people excited about it. And obviously football is a big part of that. Um, so for us, it was getting our logo and our stuff out there. If you came to Pensacola and you walked around, you might not see a West Florida logo um, in the mall or walking around. So we've really done a push like we talked about with the Oregon Athletic Club brand to get it out there, but also the university brand to get it out there. So, um, you know, really push to get that brand out there. And, and thankfully, you know, winning a couple national championships in different sports obviously helps with that. And just the visibility, I mean, football in the South speaks. So um, people get excited about it. It's created a great thing with school spirit. I mean, I have people who um, come up to me and hug me just because they still get excited about that national championship game. And they tell me every minute of where they were and what bar they were in watching it and what they were doing. And um, it's fun to be a part of that and see, see someone who, you know, before wasn't as excited, but now is really excited about their school. So we've, we've done a lot with, you know, that first year, the jerseys, what we did is we took a lot of those jerseys and had them framed and gave them to our sponsors and community partners and donors in town. So now you have jerseys on the wall of some of the bigger bars and restaurants in, in our area and get them different things to put up and gear to put out there. And 
most places, you know, they'll go online and buy it on an auction house. For us, it was, we're going to give it to you because we want you to put it up on the wall. Um, so for us, it was really trying to grow that brand, get the name out there, get people excited about the university. And now you come and, um, you know, our local supermarkets have displays that say national champs on them and they have cutouts with Argy and Coca-Cola is a big partner and has cutouts with Argy all over the place. And we have a lot of different, um, you can't go anywhere without seeing a national championship sticker or, or magnet or license plate or Argonaut gear, um, West Florida gear walking around town. So it's it's been a great transformation over the last couple of years to really see that brand and see people get excited. What we tell them is the more we win, the more successful we are, the more you help us, the more valuable your degree becomes because it becomes a bigger brand and it, it gets more national and you're more likely to get hired by somebody because they know you've graduated from the school. So um, it's really helped us from that respect. Yeah, that's amazing. The Just adding that sport and then being successful just takes you to the next level. <laughs> Nothing beats winning. There's no doubt about that. Winning is a good thing. So we were lucky enough to be in a situation where we did that. Very contagious. And just, to, just to add on that a little bit, Brett, you know, I as a, as a fundraiser, we always talk about the student athlete experience and the effect that, you know, fundraising dollars has on, you know, first generation students. Um, you know, I remember reading that, I think other than the military, um, getting a, a scholarship as a student athlete is the number one way to, to get a free education. And, you know, we pound on those points quite a bit, but the effect that investing or philanthropic giving has on the community is just, it's, it's profound. And there's a lot of scholarly research on that. Um, you know, I was just looking at uh, some numbers the other day here in El Paso and uh, in the last 120 years, our largest population growth by far was in the 1960s. Um, I don't know if this is a coincidence, but that's also when uh, uh, UTEP, uh, Texas Western at the time, won a national championship in basketball. So the more that, you know, we can, uh, we can push that community centric aspect to donors as well. You might even get some people that aren't even graduates, but they're just fans of the uh, fans of the community and want to support what uh, what helps the community, which there's no doubt that uh, a full football stadium, a full basketball arena affects the community in tangible ways. <clears throat> and Maddie, I know I've been to Lincoln. Um, you don't have the same problem that Brett had. It's constant. It's Nebraska corn huskers everywhere. Um, how has that relationship been? I know that Frost is back. There's a lot of excitement, but you're still not really winning at your primary sport. What do you say to your donors to help them stay on board and, and kind of right the ship? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's that relationship that you're building with them and, you know, letting them feel included to say, we're building a, we're building this vision, you know, we know this is not going to take place over one year and really making sure you have real conversations with them so that you're not, you're not selling something. You're saying, Hey, we're in this for the long haul, join us for this ride. So and that was kind of what I was talking about earlier is that when you're the biggest show in the state, the expectations are high. And when you had this success that we did in the nineties, um, a lot of people are so hungry for that, but with that, they're also willing to support because they want to do what they can to make sure that, we do get back to that that place where we are, a, you know, top fifteen national contender every year. And I also say, check out volleyball. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, got to got to stick with volleyball right now. Um, Paul, you do a lot with the major givers. Um, you oversee the Tiger Society, a little bit of the Bull Gator program. Can you talk a little bit about how you help secure these donors and what you do to steward them aside from your lower level annual contributors? And you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, the, the Bull Gator brand is just something that's been around since it was created in the late 70s, early 80s. Some of the originals, the Ben Hill Griffins, the George Steinbrenners, uh, that first group of 30 that just set the, the tone of what a wealthy donor would look like. And uh, we eventually got over 900 in the mid to late 2000s. That was kind of an unsustainable number. We've come back down to earth. A little bit under 700 now, but uh, it, the benefits there are really the quantity of tickets, uh, the location, and then just some of the pregame events and trips that we've done with them over the, the many years. I wouldn't necessarily call it inside access as the Bull Gators uh, benefit, but just 
just volume of access of just quantity tickets and parking. And most people in the state, I think even if they're not a graduate of the University of Florida, they know what that Bull Gator logo looks like around the state. As we've tried to build up our major gift society, uh, we're actually looking to rebrand it a little bit. We have the classic benefit structure, uh, but what we're learning is you know, what we do for a $250,000 donor versus the $500,000 prospect who's that gift is lingering out there. We might want to give them some access as well to kind of entice them and you start kind of blending those bronze, silver, gold thresholds a little bit more and then it just doesn't seem unfair. So we're looking to uh, consolidate that a little bit and really just get into the, the concierge business. And we're trying to find more and more donors who are off the grid, uh, maybe not even season ticket holders, uh, make special weekends for them and really provide a great time. The, you know, when I got here, we were very heavy into the art of fundraising and that was just relationships across the board, people that we knew uh, over the last 10 years, we've certainly implemented much more science in how we attack that. But we're reaching a, a, a point here where we're about to explode with data. Uh, we have a CRM, we have a data warehouse, we have some talented data people that we can sift through some things and uh, look into heavy wealth indicators and really go out around the state and around the Southeast to find new, new donors. So we're not just finding the 10 year season ticket holder anymore. We're finding that person who's a CEO in Atlanta and you know, would they consider a $50,000 gift, $100,000 gift? They have no interest in season tickets. So we're finally getting into, into that space. And you know, from the bull gator standpoint, we had so many touch points for a long time with them to make them feel loved. But technology has taken a lot of that away because they can manage their own accounts now. Uh, we don't have to duplicate tickets, you know, mobile tickets, they can print from home, whatever, however we've evolved. We've lost some of that. We have to kind of figure out a way to handle the masses but we're doing more of that with our major gift donors, right? Because we can, with, with a smaller group, you can drive out to the exit if you have to bring them something before they come on campus. I, I'm just trying to come up with a random example, but it's a much more intimate group to be able to take care of rather than even 700 bull gators who may have 10 tickets, 12 tickets. How do we, um, how do we manage them? And do you think that you found a lot of value having that extra brand, the Bull Gator brand, that's still connected with the Gator Boosters, but it, when you look at it, you know that that's very exclusive. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's um, any Florida grad kind of knows that term. They maybe sat in the stands in the student section, and say, "Hey, I want to be a Bull Gator." They look at those sky boxes and and premium premium seats. So much of the work is uh, is already done for us, it's somebody's desire just to be able to call themselves that bull gator. And uh, that's fortunate for us. That has not carried over to our major gift society. And that's why we're trying to rebrand it a little bit. Uh, for those of you who maybe thought you misheard Ty earlier on, uh, right now our major gift society is called the Tigert Society with a T on the end. That's our former president from hundred years ago, very integral in the creation of uh, the student athlete uh, scholarship the NCAA, formation of the SEC, helped build Florida Field, huge part of the NCAA's growth and, and our success as, a, as an athletic program. And we wanted to kind of do right and tribute to that. Uh, but it is interesting to go on the road and say Tigers, you know, when there's three programs in the SEC that has you know, three Tigers in this conference. And so it probably hasn't translated as much as we want. Plus, who's was president so long ago, who really identifies. So we're just trying to figure out a way to, to capture a, a better branding there. And, uh, and again, like I said before, kind of consolidate the levels and really just make that feel like, Hey, once you're in this society, this program, it's a lifetime, you know, the bull gator is just an annual gift. You could drop the next year. And, uh, but this 50,000, hundred thousand dollar gift, you're here forever. And these benefits, we're going to take care of you for a very long time. Absolutely. So we only have a few minutes left and I'm going to put you all on the spot here. Um, we're going to start with you, Brett. What is the future of fundraising for 2021 and, and moving forward? Well, hopefully again, actually see people face to face. That's my goal. So um, 
we've been able to do some, we'll go to meet with some donors at lunches and things, but I'm hoping next year um, we'll have some, some games. Our football season was canceled this last year. So having games and being able to see people face to face, I think people are, when I'm talking to people, they are excited to be able to come back. So seeing people at volleyball and soccer and football, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for us to hug some people and high five and get excited about our teams again. I think people are, are craving um, to get some Argonaut action. So hopefully, uh, hopefully 2021 will be a good year for us. I remember hugs. <laughs> uh, Maddie, how do we move forward? One day at a time. Our, uh, our fund was called the day by day fund for our pandemic relief fund, which I think resonated with a lot of people. But um, yeah, just for us right now, we still don't have fans. So we're, we're trying to do everything we can to stay connected with these folks and to make sure that when we, we do have fans back that they are, are ready to come back. We don't want to lose anybody because they got comfortable at home watching a game on the couch and thought that wasn't such a bad experience. So um, for us, it's, it's really dialing up, you know, um, all of our social media interactions and really good content, pregame streams, whatever we can to make sure that they're hungry to get back in that stadium. Charlie, what's next for us? Where do we go? I think Brett and, and, and Maddie definitely hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, obviously there's definitely been some minute changes just because of 2020 from a technology standpoint, but I think the principles of fundraising still, still remain. Um, you know, I think, you know, having these face-to-face -face conversations, being able to, to read individuals, um, you know, across the table or across the computer, um, I don't think those principles will necessarily change as we move forward. Um, so no, I'm just, just excited and optimistic about the future of fundraising, uh, uh, as, cause there, there has been a lot of businesses that have done really, really well in 2020 that, um, aren't necessarily raising their hands right now. So, um, we'll, we'll see where, where this goes. Then we'll finish up with you, Paul. Um, what could go wrong? What do we need to be on the lookout for? Uh, what should we plan for? Obviously, you can't plan for a pandemic, but is there anything that sticks out to you that say, hey, we need to be prepared? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I think we need maybe going back to what I said in the beginning, we just need to be prepared that maybe some people aren't going to come back. Uh, I really hope it's what Brett said, and it's just a lot of hugs and, and high fives and going around uh, tailgates. Uh, we have to realize that, you know, whatever your weakness is, the virus exposed it, right? Whatever your business weakness is, whatever is weak in your personal life, it exposed it. And everybody's gone through a whole bunch of challenges. And there have still been great moments of the past year for people and their families and their business life, but still challenging to operate through that in, in COVID. So really just getting out and getting to hear those stories, putting your arms around people, um, tell them you want to hear all about it and make them feel like they were never away from this family. Uh, we may not have seen them, but that they are always welcome back. And so I am a little bit scared about those who kind of ride off into the sunset because of, uh, like I said, those psychological hurdles of coming to a game again in, in large crowds. But you know, we saw after 9-11, the impact of implementing security that continues to ramp up and what are the costs of those things and and what are, what are the ultimate costs in the aftermath of this pandemic in terms of you know whether even just costs of cleaning a stadium but you know the, like I said the aftermath so it's it's still I know we keep saying uncertain times but I think uh, while zoom is also a great tool uh, I think like most people after the 15 days to slow the spread I already had like six virtual happy hours that I was tired of being on zoom and I wanted to see my friends face to face. And so I think, uh, and here we are a year, a year later, we gotta get out in front of people and say hello. I am absolutely with you on that. Uh, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, thank you everyone that attended this. Really wanna thank you, Paul, Charlie, Maddie, and Brett. Um, it, this was great.